Hello, my name is Joe Sosnowski. We are continuing our study of the Word in the Hellenistic world. I've included some contact information, my email address, my personal webpage, my Facebook name, and my YouTube channel where these lectures are being posted. PowerPoint handouts are available for each of these lectures. If you would like one, send me an email and I will email you a copy. Now let's begin with the Holy Spirit Prayer. Come Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit and they shall be created and you shall renew the face of the earth. O God, who by the light of the Holy Spirit instructs the heart to the faithful, grant that by the same Holy Spirit we may be truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolations. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Last semester we studied the wisdom literature of Israel. With so many Jews now living outside of Jerusalem with its temple and the temple sacrifices that were so central to Israelites' ongoing relationship with God, what developed was the wisdom literature. Whereas in the previous Hebrew texts, the Pentateuch and the prophets, God is primarily revealed to the Israelites, in the wisdom literature we find that God can also be discovered through reflecting on creation and everyday living. Their relationship with God is no longer solely bound to the temple and temple worship. It is no longer bound by physical location. Again, it is a time when the Israelites, now beginning to be referred to as Jews, are increasingly living outside of Jerusalem in a culture that is primarily Hellenistic. In this semester, semester two, Judaism in the Hellenistic world, we will look at the books that reflect on the conflict between the Jews and the surrounding Hellenistic culture. We'll start with a very brief review of the history of Israel in order to place the books we will be studying in their historical context. The Exodus in 1290, when Moses leads the Israelites out of Egypt, God gives them the Mosaic Covenant at Mount Sinai. They finally enter the Promised Land 40 years later in 1250. King David becomes king and unites the Israelite kingdom. The kingdom divides North Israel and South Judah in 922 after the death of David's son Solomon. The North Israel falls to the Assyrians and are exiled in 722. And the South Judah falls to the Babylonians in 587. The city of Jerusalem and the temple are destroyed and the people are taken into exile. This is referred to as the Babylonian exile. The Persians, who defeat the Babylonians, allow the south Judah to return to Jerusalem. The temple is finally rebuilt and rededicated in 515. Then we have the coming of Jesus 500 years later. The backdrop to these events is a series of world powers that influenced, in many cases, dominated Israel. Egypt, Assyria, Babylonia, Persia, Greece, and Rome at the time of Jesus. The books we studied last semester and will study this semester were written during this latter part of Israel's history. Let's take a closer look at the latter part of Israel's history. The Persians allowed Judah, the southern kingdom, to return to Jerusalem from the Babylonian exile. Two important points here. First, many of the people that were taken to the Babylonian exile chose not to return. A generation had passed and many had started a new life in a foreign land and preferred to stay there. Second, the northern population that fell to the Assyrians in 722, almost 200 years earlier, never did return. Sometimes these are referred to as the Ten Lost Tribes of Israel. Much of the Israelite population was becoming permanently displaced from their native homeland. The term for people living in a foreign land is diaspora. This is a map showing the locations of Jewish diaspora communities at the time of Jesus. There were communities throughout Asia Minor, Europe, and Africa. The two major centers of Judaism at the time of Jesus were in Jerusalem and Alexandria. Back to our timeline. The Persians eventually fell to the Greeks under Alexander the Great in 331. The Greeks under Alexander the Great ushered in the era of Hellenism, and more on that later. Jews experienced a brief period of true independence during the time of the Maccabees, 
but eventually came under the domination of the Romans under Julius Caesar in 63. Which brings us up to the time of Jesus. Now let's take a look at the cultural phenomena we call Hellenism. Hellenism is associated with Alexander the Great. This is a piece of a mosaic showing Alexander the Great in battle against the Persian king Darius III, taken from the larger Alexander mosaic showing the battle. Alexander the Great defeated Persia in 331, which is generally the date used as the beginning of the Greek or Hellenistic Empire under Alexander the Great. He went on to conquer most of the then known world, as far as India and Egypt. He died at the age of 32 in 323 BC, a very young man. The word Hellenistic comes from the fact that the Greek people refer to themselves as Hellens, so to be Hellenistic is to be Greek. Alexander's goal wasn't just to conquer the world, but also to spread the Greek Hellenistic culture. The word Hellenism is now used to describe the spread of Greek culture, religion, art, literature, and language throughout the Greek or Hellenistic Empire. Alexander died in 323, but the empire continued for another 300 years, finally came to an end in 30 BC with their conquest by Rome. But even with the fall of the Greek Empire, the influences of Hellenism, Greek culture, remained. Hellenism is the cultural background for much of our study this year. This semester, we will study the books of Jonah, Esther, Tobit, Baruch, 1 and 2 Maccabees, we'll spend two weeks on them, Judith, and then two weeks on the book of Daniel. The books in red are the books that are in the Catholic Bible but are not in the Hebrew or Protestant Bibles. Note, Esther and Daniel are in the Hebrew and Protestant Bibles, but the Catholic Bible has additional parts. And I'll review again the history of how that came about in a later lecture. So we begin our study with the book of Jonah. In the Bible, there are three major prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel, each with their own books, and 12 minor prophets, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, which we will study this year, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi, each with their own book. The main distinction between major and minor prophets is the size of their books. The major prophets have longer books and the minor prophets have shorter books. So we begin with the minor prophet Jonah, a very short book with only four chapters. This is Michelangelo's painting of the prophet Jonah from the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel in the Vatican in Rome. He seems to be listening to God's message and pointing to his right, thinking, saying, you want me to go there? We also see two significant images from the story, the fish that swallows Jonah and gets him back on track, and the gourd tree over his head that God uses to teach Jonah a lesson. Again, it is a short book, only four chapters. This is the outline from the New American Bible, which gives each chapter a title. In chapter 1, First Mission, Jonah gets his first calling, Go preach to the Ninevites. Nineveh was the capital city of the Assyrian Empire. The Assyrians were the traditional enemies of the Israelites. They had dominated both the Israelites' northern and southern kingdoms, and when the northern kingdom rebelled, the Assyrians deported much of the population and repopulated the north with foreigners. Da Jonah doesn't want to preach to them and gets on a boat going in the opposite direction to Tarshish. But at sea there is a violent storm and the crew figures out that it is because Jonah is running from God. They throw Jonah overboard. Jonah agrees to this. He knows he is to blame. The storm stops and the crew is saved. Jonah, meanwhile, is swallowed by a large fish and is in the belly of the fish for three days. While in the belly of the fish, Jonah has time to ponder his situation, and in chapter 2, Psalm of Thanksgiving, he prays a psalm of thanksgiving in confidence that God will save him. The fish spits Jonah back up on the shore where he started from. In chapter 3, Conversion of Nineveh, God again calls Jonah and commissions him to go and preach to the Ninevites. This time he goes. Jonah goes through the city of Nineveh, preaching God's judgment against Nineveh for their wickedness. 
God will destroy them in 40 days. Surprisingly, after only one day, the Ninevites, including the king, believe Jonah, and the king proclaims a fast, hoping God will relent and forgive them. In chapter 3, verse 10, we read, When God saw by their actions how they turned from their evil way, he repented of the evil that he had threatened to do to them. He did not carry it out. In chapter 4, Jonah's anger and God's reproof, we get Jonah's reaction to this. He's angry and wants to die. He goes outside the city and sits on a hill where God provides a gourd plant to grow up over his head to shade him. This makes Jonah very happy, but during the night the plant dies. Without the shade of the plant, the next day Jonah is exposed to the hot sun and again wants to die. God is trying to teach Jonah a lesson by pointing out to Jonah that he is more concerned over the death of a gourd plant than over the potential destruction of the entire Ninevite population. And there the story ends, not quite resolved. The key theological theme of this book is the idea of conversion or repentance. Conversion is defined in the Catechism of the Catholic Church's glossary as a radical reorientation of the whole life away from sin and evil and towards God. So the question is, of the four main characters in the story, who repents and is converted? The sailors who fear the Lord? Jonah in chapter 2 prays to God his prayer of thanksgiving, confident that God will save him, and then he obediently accepts his mission from God and goes to preach in Nineveh. The Ninevites who proclaim a fast and put on sackcloth and ashes, hoping God will relent and not destroy them. And God, who in chapter 3 verse 10 says, he repented of the evil that he had threatened to do. And then Jonah again in chapter 4, who accomplished his mission but is unhappy at the results. Ironically, Jonah is the most successful prophet of the prophets. Most of the prophets were ignored or ridiculed, or at worst persecuted for preaching to their own people. And here is Jonah preaching to Israelites' enemies, and they wholeheartedly accept this message. And this leads to a second key theme in the book of Jonah, the universality of God's care. Israel may be God's special chosen people, but God's care is not limited to Israel. God's love is universal. So the conflict here is between God's universal approach and Jonah's nationalistic approach. In Jonah's final complaint to God, he says, I beseech you, Lord, is not this what I said while I was still in my own country? This is why I fled at first to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger, rich in clemency, loath to punish. Jonah knows that God is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, rich in clemency, loath to punish. So when he gets a message to preach to Israel's enemies, he knew what that meant, and he didn't want to do it. And this theme is carried over by Jesus in the New Testament in Luke chapter 11, verse 29 to 32, and Matthew chapter 12, verse 38 to 42, when the Jews asked Jesus for a sign that he, Jesus, comes from God. Jesus refers to the sign of Jonah that will demonstrate that he is from God. The signs Jesus will give are foreshadowed by Jonah. Just as Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days and then returned to life, so Jesus will be in the tomb three days and then return to life. And just as the Ninevites, foreigners, non-Jews repented, so Jesus will be accepted by non-Jews, the Gentiles. Again, God's love is universal. We are all now sons and daughters of God. This concludes my lecture on Jonah. Next week, in Lecture 2, we will look at the book of Esther. Let's finish with an Our Father. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.